Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Deb Otis from FairVote, and I will be moderating this webinar today on the presidential primary conversation. Uh, as you all know, our election landscape is changing rapidly as we deal with all of the changes related to this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're all adjusting to big changes in our lives, our careers, maybe changes within our families, but our elections have to go on. In order to uh, maintain a strong democracy, we have to find ways to hold safe and fair elections, even in the midst of pandemics. So today we're going to be talking with some election reform advocates on the ground in a few of the states which recently held presidential primaries, uh, all using different voting procedures. We have folks from Washington and Wisconsin here, and we will also discuss uh, the situation in Alaska. So we will hear from each of these folks and then discuss what our changing landscape election or changing election landscape uh, could look like in the future. So with that, I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, from Washington, we have Mohit Mehr. Mohit is the Partnerships Director at FairVote Washington, uh, where he works to build a coalition of stakeholders and partners who are all passionate about electoral reform. Uh, from Wisconsin, we have Bob Betzig. Bob is the President and Field Director of FairVote Wisconsin. He's a stellar advocate on the ground in that state. He's also an active member of Represent Us and Voters First Wisconsin. Uh, Mohit and Bob, thank you so much for being here. We are absolutely thrilled to have you with us today. So today we will start off by talking about the ways that your states navigated your presidential primaries, and then we'll discuss uh, looking forward, reforms that we can enact to make ourselves better prepared and hold better elections in the future. Audience members, please feel free to send us questions uh, through the questions tab in the presentation, and we will reserve some time at the end to uh, address audience questions. Thanks. So Mohit, let's start with you and the situation in Washington. Uh, Washington voted almost a month ago in a primary conducted entirely by mail. So will you share Washingtonians' experiences participating in that primary? Uh, what was the process like for voters? Sure, well, first of all, Deb, thank you so much for having me on the panel um, and for the kind introduction. I'll just say that having grown up in India and Japan and recently arriving to Seattle in the fall of last year, I've had the privilege of witnessing uh, several different electoral systems firsthand. And now in my capacity as Partnerships Director at Fair Vote Washington, my job inherently involves uh, not only building an inclusive coalition of partners and stakeholders, but also simply talking to a lot of Washingtonians firsthand about how they view their electoral system. So as you mentioned, we just had the Democratic presidential primary here with uh, on March 10th. And one thing that's abundantly clear is that Washington state has a very accessible system of voting by mail. The state has been 100% vote by mail since 2011, and the way it works, um, just for context, is that all registered voters receive a ballot with a prepaid return envelope. Um, so voters can complete the ballot at home, which is crucial during a pandemic, right? Uh, ballots are mailed out up to 18 days in advance. And so voters really have the option of sending them back in at any point. Now, again, this is a great thing. It's, you know, we're in a public health crisis right now. And I think at this time, we really need to be focused around increasing turnout, making the vote accessible for as many people as possible. That being said, if you talk to any voter in Washington state, they will likely tell you how frustrating it was to submit a mail-in ballot early only to see that you wasted your vote on a candidate who subsequently dropped out. Absolutely. Uh, one of the metrics that we've been tracking at Fair Vote is the metric of wasted votes, that is votes for candidates that have already dropped out by election day. Uh, in the case of Washington, a couple of major candidates, Warren and Bloomberg, dropped out just days before uh, Washington's election day, before your deadline. And so we noticed that it looks like more votes in Washington went to these withdrawn candidates than from other states that voted on the same day. So you mentioned this is frustrating for Washingtonians. This is something that folks are already talking about. Uh, what do you see as solutions for this? Well, let, let me uh, unpack that a little bit. It wasn't just, you know, Warren and Bloomberg. It was Warren, Bloomberg, Buttigieg, Klobuchar. Within the span of a couple of days, this whole um, field of candidates winnowed down um, very, su very substantially. And all of these candidates dropped out in quick su succession before the March 10th deadline. Now, when you look at the actual wasted votes on unviable candidates, it was a staggering 390,000 votes, almost I think over 25% of all votes. These aren't hypothetical or one-off examples either. In my own family, you know, my mother-in-law was a Warren supporter. She submitted her ballot two weeks early and Warren dropped out, what, five, six days before the primary deadline. We also spoke to some county auditors who told us that they got so many notes from different frustrated voters who realized that their vote had been wasted through no fault of their own, just by being engaged early in the process. 
Now, despite the tremendous potential that we talked about with mail-in ballots to improve accessibility, increase turnout, we really weren't able to realize its full potential because we did not have ranked choice voting. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize that the Democratic presidential primary was historic in several ways. Firstly, compared to our 2016 uh, caucuses, this primary was actually consequential. You know, Washington does have 89 pledged uh, delegates and they're allocated according to the primary. The last election had caucuses and a non-binding primary that happened very late in May. So we saw higher turnout. Imagine what could have been possible if all of these voters have been able to rank their choices on the mail-in ballot. So that if I was a supporter of, let's say, Amy Klobuchar or Pete Buttigieg, they may not have faced pressure to drop out. I could have ranked them first, second, and then put down another candidate as my third choice, right? They wouldn't have faced this pressure to coalesce around a moderate candidate. The same being the case for uh, Warren and uh, Bernie. I also want to point out an analysis that you conducted, which I found very useful. It showed that you know voters who mailed their ballots later on were less likely to vote for a candidate who had already withdrawn. What this suggests is that voters knew about candidate voters who knew about candidate withdrawals in the final days adjusted their behavior accordingly. So the ones who it basically suggests that many early voters would have voted differently if they had the opportunity to do so. And I just want to end by saying it's important we contextualize all of this not as an argument against vote by mail. But really to see that the, realize its full potential, we really cannot limit voters to a single choice on the ballot. Ranked choice voting gets us there. Thanks, Mohit. That's a great uh, recap of what went down in uh, Washington and some really powerful points. Uh, at this moment, I would like to pivot to Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsinites voted more recently, just last week, with a combination of in-person voting and absentee ballots. So, Bob, uh, how did Wisconsinites feel about this election last week? Did you or people you know have to go vote in person? <laughs> uh, well, uh, voters were asked to put themselves at risk, uh, waiting for hours in long lines and a limited number of polling centers, even in the hail and rain. Uh, fortunately, it was actually pretty nice for most of the state, but there were some spots that had bad weather. Just to exercise their civic duty to vote and the fundamental tenement of our democracy. So I'll keep it G-rated here, but they felt very angry and disenfranchised. <laughs> Uh, myself, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, uh, vote in person. I actually did early voting. That's another option for us, right? Uh, so I went and did early voting with my wife uh, at the beginning, just before the COVID was coming in and we were being uh, asked to stay in place. Uh, but I do know plenty of people who uh, did have a chance to, uh, some of the poll workers, I know some of the poll workers as well too, and uh, there was a very mix of uh, activities going on. Some people had good PPE, at their poll location when they were a poll worker, others had nothing. Uh, and then good distance. I'd say, you know, for those who tried to show up, it was uh, a job well done on both sides. Okay. Uh, you know, what sort of, oh, please go ahead. I was gonna give you, you know, so so why? Why did this happen, right? I've got, I've got uh, four things that really went wrong here and I'd like to just sort of make some highlights from those. You know, the Wisconsin primary was not delayed and it should have been. You know, we had 16 other states in, in Puerto Rico that actually pushed back their presidential primary and extended their vote by mail deadlines. And it wasn't just in blue states either, right? So that's, that's crazy, that's number one. Number two, in the absence of that delayed primary, you know, vote at home systems were not scaled to accommodate the demand for last minute absentee ballot requests. Uh, fortunately, Wisconsin does have a no excuses absentee voting process in place. So that was crucial. You have to have that to be able to even have a chance at this. However, if you look at the existing infrastructure, it was just overwhelmed with the absentee request. Nearly five times as many ballots were requested as in the spring of 2016. So when you look at April 7th voters, there was uh, 1.37 million of them and the absentee requests were 1.3 million of that 1.37. And the absentee returns came in at 1.1. So 80% of the ballots cast were actually from uh, absentee ballots. And it wasn't designed that way to handle it that way, right? And we actually had about another 9,000 people who uh, their absentee ballots never got to them, as what, uh, even though they asked for them uh, toward the end of, end of March. So number three was uh, early indicators suggest that the turnout was down. Uh, so voters, you know, were confused and uh, was just uh, didn't know what to do. If you look at Milwaukee, population of about 600,000 people, they had to go from 180 polling locations to five. That's just that's just an incredible uh, compression of people into into a couple locations. And we have people in uh, locations like Green Bay where they actually waited for more than four hours past midnight to be able to cast their ballots. I think that's just you know 
you can see where that anger is coming from, right? And then the, the absentee ballot process actually required uh, back and forth that it be postmarked by April 7th, the election day, and then it didn't have to be, and then it did, and the flip-flop caused people to lose in the confusion as to what was going on there, along with uh, there was a witness signature requirement in Wisconsin, and some people, uh, there was a declared by one of the uh, courts that you didn't have to have a witness, and then you did have to have a witness when it got bumped up to the next court, and so some people sent theirs in without a witness signature on it, which essentially allowed them, uh, which is going to keep their vote from being counted at that point. And then the fourth item was uh, partisan politics got in the way, right? And there's no need to point fingers here. There was plenty of uh, issue within the parties and between the parties. Uh, but voting at home is not a partisan issue. It doesn't uh, benefit one party or the other. In reality, it puts voters uh, at risk. And uh, we just we just need to get this fixed. Yeah, that, that's a tough list of problems to overcome. Uh, what sort of activism do you think is needed in Wisconsin to uh, implement positive changes for the future? You know, I mentioned early on, uh, Fair Vote, Fair Vote uh, as before the, uh, this started, Fair Vote's a relatively small organization here. But so what we've had to do is we've had to form uh, a coalition to get a movement going here. You know, that's the movement that's going across the nation as well. I know each state really needs to do this, and it's a um, coalition of reform organizations. We're just one of the many. Uh, Wisconsin, as you, as many of you uh, listeners might have, know, is we're not a binding referendum state. Uh, we need to pass any reform through the legislature and the governor and get an agreement there. And right now we have a, a split government, a Democratic governor and our assembly and Senate are both uh, run by the Republicans. So, uh, again, it's going to take a movement of people to try and move that through. And we don't have the advantage of, of going for uh, a referendum. Uh, however, what we are doing is uh, we've got very focused on anti-gerrymandering. I know this conversation here is about the election, but... Uh, with this uh, every 10 year opportunity with the decennial uh, census coming up and then the redistricting after that, we are a incredibly gerrymandered state right now. So we need to put pressure on uh, the legislature to get them to see that way. The uh, governor has said he wants to go to a more fair redistricting process, right? Uh, so fair redistricting uh, referenda of what we've been doing. Great, thank you, Bob. Um, it looks like you might have frozen up, your video frozen for now, but we can certainly come back to you in a few minutes. Uh, at this point, um, we were hoping to have someone from Alaska join us as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And that person uh, could not make it just now, but I would love to give a couple of updates from Alaska. Um, they held the first uh, ranked choice voting primary that Alaska has ever done. Uh, this is the Democratic primary. They had almost 20,000 votes cast uh, for the Democratic primary using ranked choice voting and voting entirely by mail. Um, Alaska had planned on having some in-person voting as well, but they canceled that in, fa in the face of the pandemic. So all of, the, the, all of this was done by mail and we got the results just this past weekend. Um, we saw a really, some really interesting results uh, with ranked choice voting for presidential primaries. It is not a single winner contest. Uh, delegates, delegates on the Democratic side are allocated proportionally to everybody who gets over 15% of the vote. So when ranked choice voting was used in Alaska and in the other ranked choice states that are coming up in a few weeks, uh, wh when candidates are below 15%, uh, the last place candidates are eliminated and those voters' ballots get transferred to their next active choice. So I noticed a question come up uh, in, in our questions. Someone said, isn't there another type of wasted votes? People who vote for candidates who did not cross the delegate threshold, that's also a waste. I thought that was a great question. And we saw Alaska solving that problem. Folks who came out and voted for, say, Amy Klobuchar, uh, Michael Bloomberg, one of these withdrawn candidates, those folks had the option to rank a second choice and a third choice, up to five choices on their ballot. So if their vote went to a candidate who didn't cross the threshold, their voice could still be heard and they could support a backup choice. And so what we saw from Alaska is that over 10% of voters cast a vote for one of those candidates who had withdrawn weeks prior. Uh, we're not counting Bernie Sanders in that because his withdrawal was right around the time that a lot of Alaskans were voting. Uh, so 10% of ballots had ranked first a candidate who uh, had already withdrawn and almost all of those people 
ranked a second choice. Almost all of those people had their ballot end up counting for one of the two viable candidates by the end. It ended up being split about evenly. Of those 10% of people who uh, did not have their first choice still in the race, some went to Sanders and some went to Biden. Um, we only saw a small number of those that uh, did not rank any of the front runners. So we had ranked choice voting, ensuring that more votes were counted and more Alaskan Democrats had their voices heard. So that's an update on what happened in Alaska. I think it's fantastic to see them combining vote by mail for safety and convenience with ranked choice voting to solve this wasted votes problem. So that's a true success story. And we can all keep our eye out for the next few ranked choice voting states. Um, we have Hawaii, we have um, Wyoming, and we have uh, Kansas. I'm sorry about that. So we have all three of those states coming up uh, within the next few weeks, and we can expect more great ranked choice results from those. So that is the update. Oh, uh, yes. I think you did you lose me? We did lose you for a few minutes. Yes. Um, did you want to jump back in? You were telling us about the activism that can happen on the ground in Wisconsin to help make some of these changes. Yeah, I'm not sure where you lost me. I was talking about uh, doing anti gerrymandering. That's our first thing that we're after here. Um, did you did you hear any of my re results from our gerrymandering uh, referenda? Uh, no, please repeat those. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, we're looking to do anti-gerrymandering. That's our first step since this only comes up in the decennial opportunities that we have for reset, resetting our districts. Uh, we actually, in this election, we actually had, this, uh, had nine more counties that we looked to have past referenda. They're only uh, advisory. They're not binding referenda. We still need to convince the legislature to make the changes. Uh, so now we have 51 of uh, 72 counties in Wisconsin that have passed these, and it's always in the 70s or 80 percent range. So it's not a, bar, a partisan issue here. This is Democrats and Republicans and independents who are all voting for these and want to see that happen, but we have to convince our legislature to do that. Once we get referendum in, or once we get gerrymandering taken care of, then we're moving on to the election reform. We're, we're looking to do the final five as an open primary and ranked choice voting. We have uh, dr bills drafted for that, but not introduced. Uh, there's a timing we'll put with that once we get some of the gerrymandering things figured out here. After that, we're going to look for voter access and election security. At least we thought that's what we were going to do. Now that's going to have to move up to the head of the list here. So we'll be working on that now to uh, help ourselves with the November election. And then we'll go after reducing uh, influence of money in politics. That's sort of the order we're taking things at. Fantastic. Uh, it's a long list. I'm thrilled that we've got strong advocates like you on the ground working on these issues. Thank you. Uh, so at this point, um, I would like to talk about uh, the next election cycle. So both of your states and Alaska as well are scheduled for some more primary elections, uh, congressional primaries coming up in August, and then of course the general election in November. And at this point, we don't know how long our social distancing and uh, limiting crowds uh, requirements will last. So let's look ahead to what our elections might look like uh, the next time. So. Um, Let's start with Mohit again. Uh, what changes are underway already in Washington to prepare for the next round and what more could your state be doing? So let's talk about the August election, the primary, uh, because it is different from the Democratic presidential primary, right? Here in Washington, we have a top two uh, system, top two primary system for all non-presidential elections, all partisan primaries. So um, even, you know, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal is up for re-election. Re so the U.S. Senate, the U.S. Congress, the state Senate and the state House are all, uh, are all up for re-election. Um, so those races, there will be essentially the top two winners from that primary will advance to the general election. One thing we commonly see in those races is vote splitting. So a good example is the 2016 state treasurer's race, where you had three Democratic candidates run against two Republicans. And uh, essentially, because a majority of the electorate preferred a Democrat, uh, that vote split even if the majority preferred a Democrat, that vote split three ways, and you had two Republicans advance to the general. This is not a partisan issue. It happens on both ends of the spectrum to both parties. Um, it's another reason why we really need ranked choice voting. We talked about it in the presidential contest. We definitely need it in the top two contest. We can say that the top two is a definite improvement, but we still have a long ways to go before we can uh, sort of fully achieve um, elections that are representative. Um, you asked what we're doing in Washington state. I'd like to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, Fair Vote Washington has been heavily engaged on the legislative front. We have a local options bill. Um, that was uh, that's local that's permissive essentially. So you know any jurisdiction that wishes to use ranked choice voting currently under state law is unable to do so. 
What the local options bill does, once it passes in the legislature, it would allow any such jurisdiction, be it a school board or a city council, to be able to use ranked choice voting. We've already seen uh, jurisdictions like the Bellingham City Council pass a resolution saying we really want to use ranked choice voting. Um, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to do that. So that's one thing we've been actively working on. We'll be back at it in Olympia next, uh, next session. In addition to that, there's a little nuance here in that nonpartisan charter counties. Um, among the 39 in Washington, there are three nonpartisan charter counties. That's King, Whatcom, and uh, San Juan County. So these counties can actually move, uh, do a simple charter amendment process um, through gathering signatures, and they can essentially move to ranked choice voting without the local options bill. So we've also been talking to a lot of council members um, before the COVID pandemic, we were thinking about gathering signatures in San Juan County because the, uh, the folks there have a lot of interest in getting ranked choice voting on the ballot. Um, we're still reassessing that depending on when the governor lifts the shelter in place order due to an abundance of caution. Um, but those are some of the different avenues we're exploring in Washington. Deb, you might be muted. I can't uh, hear you. I'm sorry about that. I think I was muted. Thank you. So, uh, Bob, same question for you. Uh, we already talked about a few of the avenues that uh, you believe that where change is needed uh, in your state. Um, are there any? Is there anything else that you think we could be working on, or anything else in particular you'd like to highlight? You know, I think uh, given the state of our last uh, election here, it's it's very much. Uh, focused on the on the present, we got we got to be very short term in thinking to make sure we can get into this uh, next uh, presidential election here. And we have an August primary coming up too for our for our state uh, set of primaries. So I, I think focusing on the immediate needs, you know, we can't let Wisconsin become the Florida of the 2020 race for president. Uh, Wisconsin's confusing mess of spring elections. You know, we had changes in rules, contradictory court rulings, and delayed results. You know, we can't repeat that. And our governor and legislature actually have, we got six months until November to prepare for a high turnout, hotly contested presidential vote. And Wisconsin is one of those states that expected to be a decision maker, right, for what this outcome of this, this race. So we're very keen on that. You know, we don't want Wisconsin to become the Florida of 2020. Remember back uh, in the year 2000 in Florida, the nation was sort of held in suspense there where we we're looking at hanging shads and confusing butterfly ballots and stuff. And I got to tell you, with some eerie similarity, that looks a lot like our clerks who are now looking at uh, trying to determine which absentee ballots to count and which lawsuits are going to come in and which ones they're not even receiving. People frequently receive a ballot uh, in their request. So that's sort of where our focus is. Uh, more specifically, actually, within the large coalition that we have, we've got, uh, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of eight things that we're asking our governor and legislature to do here is uh, mail-in ballots to all registered voters automatically. That doesn't happen today, right? We'd like to have that done automatically to everyone. Allow the voters to return ballots multiple ways, either dropping them off or in the mail. Uh, every municipality should have a minimum number of polling locations. Think back to that five that were in the, the city of Milwaukee where there's only usually 180, right? And they need to be located in areas where all populations can be served adequately. Uh, In-person uh, access to early voting and registration is, is uh, one thing that we'd like to make sure as well, too. And then along with that goes voter registration should be as easy as possible and make it automatic through our voter registration through, you know, either in schools or Department of Motor Vehicles, wherever that might be. Uh, all voters should remain uh, on the voter rolls. I know if you saw, but there was an attempt to take uh, over 200,000 voters off the rolls just because they didn't return a postcard that was mailed to a previous address, perhaps. Uh, but we need something positive. Either the voter takes action or the governor, government record, such as a death record, comes up that might be taking them off. And the government should fund some public education. This is a big change for states when you go through and uh, more people doing absentee to make sure that this is well done. And we have, uh, you know, a, a very um, uh, diverse uh, state, as many do, and we want to make sure people who have a second language that's not English are able to understand this as well, too, when they go through the absentee balloting process. So those are the things that we're pushing for our uh, governor and legislature to make happen. I'd love to see a uh, August uh, dry run of that in the primaries, try to get some things working, and then make sure that it's tuned up in time for the November uh, presidential election. Again, we don't want to have uh, Wisconsin's uh, version of hanging chads holding us all over in suspense about what's going to be who's the next president here. Uh, a first question I saw here was uh, a question about Washington. 
it, they ask, do, uh, do we have numbers for the voters in Washington who waited to see who dropped out, but then sent their ballots in too late to be counted? Uh, Mohit, question. would you fill like that if, one? Yeah, if you, I feel like if we go to the website, we can find that out. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head right here, but you can go to SOS. Uh, dot the Secretary of State uh, gov uh, slash elections, and you'll be able to find those numbers there, hopefully. I do not have them off Fantastic. the top of my though. Uh, one other Washington-related question here. Uh, for states like Washington that do entirely vote by mail, is there a proactive process to make sure that registered voters' mailing addresses are up to date? That's another great question. Um, I think that is checked. I know Secretary uh, Kim Wyman has been uh, talking about that quite uh, quite rigorously, and she's been following up on this. Um, and also the fact that you know, one other aspect that I forgot to touch on was the voter the security aspect of it, because one of the things that you know in the current climate people have been talking about is switching to vote by mail um, sort of negatively impacts security. I know that's been a big priority for the Secretary of State and the county auditors. The way in which the ballots are are counted and the addresses are verified is quite rigorous. So. Um, we've been doing this for a while. It's been in place since 2011. Um, and I know that, yeah, it's, it's a pretty rigorous process. Fantastic. Um, the next question I saw is one for, is a question for Wisconsin. Um, and this question asks, does Wisconsin provide election department drop boxes or are the absentee ballots returned through the mail? Uh, Bob, I think you already touched on the drop boxes a little bit. There's a mix of that uh, dependent on the clerk in the municipality. Okay, I like that that was on your list of reforms that's needed to expand that access. Correct, we'd like to see the op all options at all locations and all, all, all uh, sectors, yes. Okay, great. Um, I see that we have been joined by Amber Lee from Alaska. Uh, from Alaska. Amber, thanks for joining us, how are you? Good, thank you. Sorry I had technical difficulties. Oh, I'm glad you could make it. Uh, so I'll do a brief introduction and then we would love to hear your thoughts about uh, how things were on the ground in Alaska. Okay. Um, we are connected with Amber because she is a PR consultant who was part of the education project for Alaska's ranked choice voting presidential primary. Uh, she's a communications professional with a broad range of experience and she has been a key strategist in Alaska's congressional health care and climate change discussions in addition to her work uh, with the ranked choice voting project. So Amber, we did speak a little bit about uh, Alaska's method of doing vote by mail combined with ranked choice voting and how that, that solved some of the problems that we've seen in other states. Uh, would you give us your impressions? What was that like on the ground and how did voters feel about that? Well, we were very lucky that we had started this about a year ago um, because of what happened with the coronavirus. We didn't end up in a situation like they had in Wisconsin. and. Um, the um, the Democratic Party had determined that ranked choice voting um, and that um, mail-in ballots would be best for Alaska because we're we're so spread out. Alaska is basically the size of the entire United States, and a lot of the communities are off of the road system. They're only accessible by airplane. So trying to get people together into caucuses just was it was unfair. And then also um, the way that the the caucuses worked, people felt like they weren't being represented um, whenever they were voting for their different delegates. And so there was a lot of strife internally with the party with the way that that was working. And so ranked choice voting allowed people to vote for people, the people that they wanted to vote for. Um, and um, so initially um, they were just doing mail-in ballots and then they were gonna meet in um, some community centers for a traditional kind of voting in person. But um, all of the public areas closed down. And at that point, we switched just completely to the mail-in ballots and we extended it just a little bit. And um, there was a 200% increase in the number of people who participated um, in this entirely new way to vote. You would expect that with the ballot being different and with the um, mail-in ballot and the first time people are doing this, that, the, that there, there wouldn't be that much of an increase, but people were very excited to be able to vote still, to not have their health be put in any kind of danger. Um, and then um, to be able to still vote for whomever they wanted and not feel like they were throwing their vote away. Um, there were a lot of people, I was on a call with 
some Democrats yesterday and, and, you know, people were like, well, I still got to vote for, for my girl, you know, and, and they, so there wasn't that kind of like, why are we even doing this? They, they still felt like their voice was heard uh, and that they weren't throwing away their voice. Um, if they voted for somebody that they thought wouldn't necessarily in the end, um, be the, um, the candidate that went forward. And then um, now this is going to be used as a template because our our general election will most likely be vote by mail as well. And we've already gone through, this is the first time we've done a statewide vote by mail process and it was successful. Um, they were able to turn it around where the ballots were counted within the next day so people knew what was happening. It was all very clear. And so there's a lot of confidence now in, in the process and also a lot of interest in looking at rank choice applied to different, um, applied to the general election down the line and to other elections. So uh, I think it was extremely successful in just increasing participation by 200%. I mean, that's just incredible. That's fantastic. Uh, so we, we know that Alaskans are also preparing for a ballot question in November about uh, expanding use of ranked choice voting in addition to top four primaries. Uh, do you think that Alaska Democrats' experience with ranked choice voting will make them more or less favorable on that, that ballot question? And what about Republicans who did not get a chance to use ranked choice in their primary this year? But, you know, there's always a little bit of fear about things that are new. So I think that with the Democrats, that it, having done it and understanding that it's not overly complicated and then seeing how it, um, they were able to see the counts um, as they narrowed down so they could see how that worked. And there really wasn't a huge shift. Um, uh, you, you, the person who was going to win was going to win anyway. So they felt... Um, I think it built a lot of confidence that it's not too complicated. You get the ballot and you just pick the people that you want. Um, and um, I, I think uh, people are excited about the idea of being able to vote for the person that they want to vote without feeling like there's a spoiler um, or, you know, so I, um, in terms of the Republicans, I know that there is um, support from Republicans and Democrats for this issue um, across the state. A, a lot of um, young Republicans and young Democrats are really excited about this idea because they they want to be they want to be more empowered. Um, they feel like the party, you know, is pushing, which parties are great, but they feel like the party has more power than they do as an individual. And um, I think this is empowering for them. It is going to take more education. Um, I think especially for the people who didn't go through the process so that they feel comfortable, like it's a, an easy process that they're able to do and, and not cumbersome in any way. Fantastic. Uh, we also got a couple of audience questions related to Alaska. So Amber, if it's all right, I will hit you with a couple more questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one person says, uh, please describe how the votes were counted in Alaska. Was it by the Secretary of State's office? No, the votes were actually counted by the party. Um, it was it was amazing. They had um, volunteers come in and they had to socially distance them. So they were all spread out across the office. Um, I know that they there was a vendor who assisted with the initial counting. And I don't know all the details on that. I, that's more technical than what I got into. But the, the uh, volunteers from the party themselves um, came in and, and went through the ballot counting process. Um, it was they had pictures of them. They had their masks and their gloves, and they were all separate. Um, but they worked really hard to go through that many ballots and get it done by the next day. Um, but yes, it was the party who did that. Okay. And uh, one other uh, audience member question about Alaska. Someone asks in Alaska, was there just one redistribution round? Uh, Amber, would you like to address that one as well? There were multiple redistribution rounds. Um, I can't rem remember exactly how many, but there were multiple. Uh, I could chime in here. I was looking at these numbers recently. Uh, it looks like there were eight rounds of, of redistribution. So they eliminated one candidate at a time in each round. Um, the reason they do that rather than uh, just do two rounds is because throughout the count, it's possible that 
a candidate who did not initially cross the 15% threshold might pick up enough votes to cross the threshold in a later round. And then that candidate would deserve delegates. Uh, so they eliminate candidates one at a time. And in Alaska, it took eight rounds until all candidates had either been eliminated or had crossed the threshold. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, we have more audience questions coming in. This is great, keep them coming, folks. Um, I see one uh, about Wisconsin. Uh, the question is, is Wisconsin considering multi-member districts as a solution for gerrymandering? Uh, Bob, would you chime in on that? Uh, that's probably the fifth thing in our list of things to do. Uh, we want to get the uh, uh, final five and RCV in place. If we can do that, we'll go to that. Uh, we'll try to get that next. We don't think we'd be able to get that to pass as well now either. So it's sort of a strategic uh, march down through the things we think are most likely to get first and move them forward. Okay. Great. I'm glad that's on the list at some point. Um, we will take just a couple of more questions and then I think wrap this up. Um, so the next one is uh, Alaska again. So uh, someone asks, is it possible to see a sample ballot from that Alaska primary? Amber, are those available? They are. They're on um, akdems.org. They have the ballot up on the website and um, so that people were able to see it before they came in. And they also, um, because um, Alaska receives their ballots by mail and they mail them back in to make sure that people were able to get it. Our mail, our plane shut down into rural Alaska um, because of the coronavirus. So they allowed um, people to download the ballots um, from online. So the actual ballot itself is online and downloadable so people can take a look at that. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and the last question for today, once again, Alaska. Uh, Amber, was the party's counting done manually or electronically? It was, uh, I believe it was a mix. I know that they did have a, have a vendor um, who helped with the initial counting and then individuals hand count the ballots after that first round. Okay, fantastic. Uh, and then one final question. I said it was the last one, but we've got one more that I would I would love to discuss. Uh, how can I help make ranked choice voting happen in my state? So I know from my perspective uh, here at Fair Vote, we are working hard on the week of action coming up in May. So you could check out our website. Uh, and there's a whole list of actions that you can take for that. Uh, and then I would also love to hear one or two items from each of the three of you. What are ways that people can get involved in this fight in their own states? Uh, Mohit first. Sure. Thank you for that question. Um, there's a couple of things we can do. Um, so one thing is you can call your legislators and write in support of the local options bill because we've been trying to pass that in the legislature. Again, it's a permissive bill. It doesn't mandate that any jurisdiction has to use ranked choice voting, but there are several that we've already spoken to that really want to use it. So get your legislator um, to talk about ranked choice voting. We have 27 co-sponsors on the bill. We had 27 co-sponsors in this past session. It'll be reintroduced next session. Um, the other thing you can do is uh, go to our website, sign up to be a supporter. We have thousands of supporters across the state. Next year, we may be looking at a statewide ballot initiative. Um, it's not final yet, but we do want to, you know, gather about 350,000 signatures or so, or, or so over 10 months to get an initiative to the legislature um, to get ranked choice voting statewide. So we will need all the support we can get. In my capacity as partnerships director, if you have organizations that would like a presentation on ranked choice voting, would like to use ranked choice voting, we've been talking to different unions to use ranked choice voting in their local chapters. Um, so that would be another great way to get involved. And the last thing I just want to say, which I didn't get to talk about in the presentation, we talked about ranked choice voting in the Democratic presidential primary, the impact on vote splitting, um, making sure that your second and third choice votes, votes are counted. There is a substantial way in which ranked choice voting also improves diversity and representation. In Washington state, there's the county of Yakima, which is about 48% uh, Latinx, um, and yet in its entire history has only elected one Latinx commissioner to its three county commission. So they're, they're actually facing a challenge under the state, the Washington Voting Rights Act, um, and both remedies proposed use ranked choice voting, um, with the preference being what Bob talked about, the multi-winner ranked choice voting or proportional representation, because it's the best way to account for population disbursements. It's the best way to make sure that you get adequate representation in proportion to the electorate. Um, I'll end by saying that. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Mohit. Uh, Bob, how about you? How can people get involved? You know, as I mentioned, we have this uh, split government here of uh, Democrats and Republicans, and it's a gerrymandered state, so there's uh, several safe Republicans. 
we really got to break that hold first. And that's our that's why our anti-gerrymandering move is going forward here. So help us with that. And then we can move on to the ranked choice voting in a, a final five open primary. And to do that, uh, you know, we've, as I mentioned, we have 52 of the 72 uh, counties now have passed referenda at 70 plus percent in all those counties. And uh, so if it's not come to your county yet, watch for it. There are some more coming up in the November election that we're trying to do, push those through. And that puts pressure on our elected officials to essentially hopefully come to the table and negotiate for a fair redistricting in 2021. That's probably the biggest thing we can do first. And then we would love to get into the process of going after ranked choice voting. But first things first, that's our strategy. Sounds great. Thank you. And Amber, how about you? How can folks get involved? Well, there is a ballot initiative um, that is go that going on right now. It'll be on the ballot in November, and people can um, contact the folks who are working on that, volunteer their time. But also, um, you know, Alaska, we don't have a football team, and they say that our sports teams are basically um, our uh, Democratic and Republican parties. And so the entire state is very um, interested in politics, but it, it's gotten um, very unneighborly, I would say is a good word for it. And a lot of Alaskans are tired of that. And I think putting your voice out there to say that there is a different way to do things, um, that it doesn't need to be so partisan, that we can pull back together um, and, and telling people there is a solution for that. And it is this ranked choice voting, which puts the power back in the hands of the people um, and gives people kind of you know, more opportunity to to really follow their hearts whenever they're voting for things instead of thinking about strategy, which, you know, it's necessary, but it doesn't always feel nice. Uh, so, you know, talk on social media, write letters to the editor, um, get involved and learn more about it and, and um, educate people in the state so that they feel comfortable. Change is hard, but whenever they see that people around them um, are, you know, advocating for it. That's a big step. Great. Thank you, Amber. Uh, powerful words there. And thanks to all of you. Uh, this is a, is a tough time for our elections, but I feel better knowing that we have such strong advocates on the ground, uh, working hard on this fight and working to bring other people in to all, all work on improving our elections together. Uh, that wraps up our time for today. Thanks to everyone who signed in to participate and for submitting all of those fantastic questions. Thanks again for our three panelists, Mohit, Bob, and Amber. It was great talking with you today. Thank you for making the time. So everyone stay safe out there and keep fighting the socially distant fight to improve our elections. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.